thank you for having me here. I just wanted to say this is, I've uh, joined uh, your wonderful group before, but this is the first time you're all in the Sangha house that I'm joining <laughs> you. So just such a delight to see the altar, the background and everything. So I don't know how long you've had this, but congratulations and just such a joy uh, to be virtually in this space with all of you. Uh, Hello, friends. For those of you that are present in the room and online, my name is Sai Ganesh, as Maitre introduced. I'm one of the managers of Ananda Paula Walto. Uh, I discovered the autobiography of Yogi pretty early on. And uh, certainly, as it is for most of us, it was a pretty transformational book for me. And it, uh, uh, I had just graduated college, and from then on, one step led to the other. I came to the US uh, in 2011. I met Swami Kriyananda. I had already started with SRF before that point and I finished all the lessons. Uh, once I met Swamiji, I found my home here at Ananda. And since then I've been living here uh, in, our, in the Ananda community here in Palo Alto. I started working in tech, but for the last few years, almost five years now that I transitioned into this role of working for the Sangha, teaching and uh, helping manage our operations here in Palo Alto. So again, a joy to be with all of you today. And uh, what a wonderful topic that we have. Uh, reason versus intuition. Last week, I think it was, or the week before we, the topic was by thinking, can we arrive at understanding? They're very close. And uh, it is such an important principle for all of us to think about. I'll just share briefly, and then obviously we'll have a discussion after. I want to start with a story that some of you may have heard, because this is one that Nayaswami Devi, who is one of the spiritual directors of Ananda, she shares the story often. This is apparently about farmers in New England. I didn't know anything about this until she shared the story. Apparently, there are a lot of jokes about that. If anybody is from there, you guys are all from the deep south, so probably not. Um, but this is about a farmer in New England, and somebody somewhere out in the boonies in the country, somebody meets a farmer and asks for a direction to go to a certain place. And then the farmer looks at the address and he looks at this person and he says, oh, you go straight and then you take a ride and then you keep going another 10 miles down that road and then you take a left. Oh, wait a minute, that won't get you there. And then he said, let's backtrack. You go straight and instead of taking ride, you go left and then you go five miles there and then, then again you take a left and then you go from there and then you keep going and then he says, oh no, that wouldn't take it take you there either. And then he just pauses for a minute and he says, maybe you just go straight down the same road and then again at the end, wherever the road ends, you take a ride and from there, oh no, that wouldn't take you there either. And then he just pauses for a moment, looks at this person with the address and then says, I don't think you can get from here to there. <laughs> so, you know, unlike the farmer's story, on the spiritual path, that is actually true. It is so hard for us to sometimes fathom this concept that the thinking mind cannot really uh, grasp or integrate any true spiritual realization. It all has to come from our intuitive perception. It all has to come from a place within, from a place of knowing from a place of actually feeling what truth is. Uh, recently, I've been thinking about a story in the life of Helen Keller. I think uh, most of you would know. Uh, she was the person who in invented the Braille language for blind people to read and to communicate. And this is a story very early on from her life when she was just a child. And uh, Helen Keller was not born disabled. She had some kind of disease or some illness that led to her blindness. And she was also, she lost also, uh, I don't know whether she was born this way or not, but she was also deaf and dumb. So she did not hear, she did not speak, and she did not see. So all of this happened suddenly with the illness that affected her during her childhood. Suddenly she lost most of her ability to relate with and communicate with the world around her. And um, she was born to very good parents and <laughs> So everybody was really struggling to see how they can help her. Suddenly there was this child with all the potential, but she was just cut off from all the external world. And, uh, you know, they tried different teachers, different schools and everything. And finally they find a teacher. This is the most beautiful part of Helen Keller's life. There's so much more that happened after that, but I just love this part of that story. 
where this teacher was trying, this teacher herself was somewhat disabled, but not in all the ways that Helen was. She was trying to communicate and work with Helen to find some way of helping this girl relate to the world around her, finding some mechanism for learning, for communication. And then gradually this idea came to that teacher. She started tapping on Helen's hand. And very soon, Helen just made this leap in had this leap of understanding where she realized that she could connect this tapping with some object in the real world that somehow a certain kind of tap because Helen had uh, sight and other senses at some point in her childhood. So these were not alien to her. And the moment she made that understanding, that was the pivotal point in Helen's journey because then she realized suddenly through this tiny little doorway, the whole world could be hers. That the world which was so alien, which she had no connection to, as soon as she had that leap in understanding that there could be a connection between what the teacher was tapping on my hand and something in the real world, suddenly a whole universe opened up in front of her. I was thinking about that story because, you know, there was no way through which the rational mind or words or communication could get this across to heaven. She had to have some kind of knowing, some kind of realization, for lack of a better word, through which she could reach that place of just feeling into it, of understanding, oh yes, that light bulb moment. I know this could happen. And then from then on, so much became possible. Our spiritual path is not as simple as that. It's not simple as one understanding. It's so incremental. It's a gradual expansion of our realization of our awareness of our experience, slowly, bit by bit, and at every step, whether or not we are able to understand or realize it in that same way, there is an intuitive leap. There is some level of intuitive understanding that is helping us transcend the limitation of the mind. In one of the Ray's reading, not this one, Swami Kriyananda gives this beautiful analogy that I enjoy and I share it a lot whenever I teach meditation or other beginning classes. He talks about rational mind as being, uh, as being like the train on tracks like a train that goes on tracks. And because of the very nature of a train and tracks, it can only travel on tracks of past experience. A train can take multiple directions, but it cannot just, the whole world is not its canvas. There are only certain directions it can go. In the case of a train, it's actually true. You cannot get from here to there if there are no tracks there. And that's what the rational mind is. You cannot get from here to there unless it is already part of your past experience. Whereas the superconscious mind, the soul's intuition is not limited by the past. It's not limited by patterns of behavior. It's not limited by what we know, we don't know, what we understand, what we don't understand. Uh, suddenly, just in a moment, something could be part of a reality. Something could be part of how we relate to the world around us, how we relate to higher realities. And it's just given like this in a flash. We realize <clears throat> it. We receive it from our own higher self. And, you know, we all have to remember as much as we are trying to study, understand, and uh, really grasp all these teachings, all of us are here because at some point we have had this intuitive realization. On some level, we have had some kind of intuitive knowing of just feeling this is mine, this is true. Even the very idea of God, to believe in God, it cannot happen just by looking at the world around us. Just look at it. It is consistent on the level of the senses. Everything works based on the laws of physics. Why do we need a God to explain all of this? And yet we all know the love we feel, the joy we are seeking, the wisdom that we know to be ours, the clarity of soul intuition, all of this is so beyond anything that can be explained by the laws of science. And we know it all comes from a higher place, from a higher reality. And we go through that experience over and over again. That's the thread that ties us to our own spiritual source. That's what inspires us and helps us move forward in our spiritual journey. I know many years ago, somebody walked into our temple here in Palo Alto, and this person had lost 
I can't quite remember who it was. They had lost a very dear person in their life. Maybe it was a spouse, maybe it was a son. I don't remember. It was a few years ago. And I greeted this person and I was trying to see what I could offer. And then, you know, I felt guided to tell her, you know, maybe you want to come tomorrow whenever you're free during the day. I would love to meditate with you and I would love to do something called an astral ascension. Astral ascension is the ceremony that we read when a soul leaves. And it's just a way for us to find a place of resolution or just uh, see this person in that light because they have moved on, on and will help us move on to this person identified as some sort of Christian. I don't remember or maybe she didn't share with me. I don't, um, I can't quite re recollect right now, but she was, uh, we had a connection and she did return back. I haven't seen her since then. It's, uh, this was not her path or not yet. Um, so she came and I read the Astral Ascension and as I was standing there, I started reading it. I realized, you know, this person has never entered our temple. And for those of you that have even seen pictures of the Palo Alto temple, we have a pretty imposing altar. You know, it's, it's almost life-size. The faces of the masters are bigger than life-size. It's huge. And the altar goes up to about, I don't know, at least 25, 30 feet. So, because we have a temple up that sees 200 people in the back and see the altar from way behind. So we have this huge imposing altar and I'm looking at this astral ascension ceremony, then do I want to read this? You know, I start reading the Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar Giri, Paramahansa Yogan. And this guy, this lady is gonna think I'm just nuts. What? <laughs> this is gibberish. I mean, not nuts. She knew that I had my own spiritual affiliation, but she she's gonna find all of this alien. Do I want to read all of this? It was just a momentary flash. It was not something I was thinking. I just knew the answer was no, I needed to. I needed to read this exactly the way Swami wrote it. So I just started praying, Jesus Christ. Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar. And then I realized even just when I finished the prayer, I was, my rational mind was thinking, this is going to sound like gibberish to her. But she was receiving something that um, I couldn't deny that it was so clear to me. She was finding solace, she was finding some peace. And I needed to remind myself, there's no way she was going to find this peace through her rational mind. And she was not. She was finding it somewhere else. She was finding just in the vibration of that sanctuary of just meditators being there and all of us praying seriously and deeply to God for years. How many years has the sanctuary been there? She was finding that salas through the friendship I was offering to her. She was finding her salas in that ceremony that Swami had written that was given to Swami from a higher place. And all these words and all these things that we try to make sense of on the level of the rational mind, it was Greek and Latin, but on a deeper level, she was so deeply touched and moved. I was so gratified and happy when the ceremony ended. You know, we meditated for like three minutes because she didn't have any experience with meditation. And, you know, the whole thing was over in 15 minutes, but I could just feel this was just so deeply meaningful. And it was such a critical step in her own healing journey, a healing that is so outside of the rational mind. That is nothing that we can really make sense of. You know, I'm reminded right now of a story that Asha shared many years ago. You know, some a mother brought her daughter to our temple and she was very drawn and she kept bringing her daughter over and over again to the temple. And then this mother, a few months into it, shared a story with Asha. Her daughter was speaking with one of her friends. And apparently this mother is on the lookout for her community, her church, and she was trying out different, uh, you know, universal temple places that she could go to. And uh, this girl was uh, telling her friend, her mother overheard it. You know, we go to a new temple now. We follow Parmesan Yugoslavia. <laughs> 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 you know? Honestly, what difference does it make? You know, I don't mean we would fall apart. You know, the names we use, you know, the image, the name, the books we read, all of these are in a way a doorway, a doorway into something that we cannot understand, that we have to feel into. They all carry the vibration, not of themselves, of something that was behind, of this great avatar, this great light that descended in this particular form. And we use all this likeness 
you know, the words, the books, the images we use, all of that to tune into it. But ultimately, we are not tuning into the word. We are not tuning into the pages of the book. We are not tuning into simply the image or a picture, but what was behind it. We are tuning into the living vibration of a great master who is guiding all of our lives. And that is not something that cannot that can be explained with the mind. That is not something that is in and of, of itself, something we can grasp through the senses. It is something we have to feel. And all of us are here because we have felt it at some point. We have felt that there's some answer that I'm seeking that can perhaps be, perhaps be found in this vibration, that this is what will help me right now in my life. And the more we return to that place of intuitive knowing, to that place of soul intuition, the more we get closer, the more we become aware, the more we feel that connection with that higher source, we are less confused. We are less confused. And when we need that solace, when we need that healing, when we are looking for that peace, we find those answers a little more easily because that presence is always there guiding us. There's a beautiful line from the book, God Alone. I'll end with this, written by Gyanamata. Uh, this is a book of letters, that letters of counsel that she wrote to people. And in one of her letters, she shares, you know, of her guru, of our guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, writing of counseling a disciple. She says, the guru comes onto this plane only as much as I come through this letter. And I've thought about that statement a lot. You know, you receive a letter from somebody or, you know, most likely you receive an email from somebody. I write an email to a friend, but I am not in that email. But I am coming through that email. They can read what I'm trying to say, but I'm not that email. I'm somebody that is so far outside of that email. That email could never summarize who I am. It could never be the entirety of my definition. But there's a part of me that reaches this other person through that email. It is the same way through in which God comes to us. God comes to us through all the great avatars. God came to us through Jesus, Babaji, and then Yogananda. And he came through that body only to the extent to which we can come through in an email. There's so much more behind it that we cannot necessarily grasp or understand. And they gave us these emails. These are love letters as somebody once shared a beautiful quote. I don't know where this is from. Uh, it said, saints are love letters written by God to mankind. So God writes all of these love letters but he writes these letters so we would seek more. We would seek more, seek what is behind, seek to intuitively realize that divine presence within all of us to actually get beyond the limitations of our own identity, all that we think of as ourselves, that we, that we put so much energy into holding on, we would finally loosen that grip. And then he can share more. He can share to us, uh, not as ideas, not even as knowledge or knowing, but as a kind of wisdom that is born out of soul receptivity that is given to us intuitively. Um, you know, I wanted to, before I finish, just share a small piece of music. Uh, Swami's music carries so much more power than any words of wisdom or anything that any of us can share. and. We all have the pleasure of chanting, and Maitri is such a beautiful chanter. I, I was tuning into some of the chants I was hearing for the first time, which was so uplifting. Um, just a small song that I wanted to share of Swami's before we finish. It's one of my favorite songs that I like to sing. This is called Mother of Us All. Your children, mother, call you, knowing not it's you they call. Some through mists of their unknowing, bruised and hurting when they fall. Turn away, but who can leave you? Us all. 
if the child forgets its mother, will she call it turn away? Wise or foolish, we your children guide us, mother, if we stray. Those whose hearts are torn with anguish lack the power your name to call. Heal their wounds, mom, soothe their sorrows. You, the mother of us all, Heal their wounds, love, so their sorrows. You, the mother of us all. Thank you so much, Sai Ganesh. Um, you are you have a beautiful voice and a beautiful instrument of Divine Mother and Swami's music too. So that's it's always a joy to have you share in that way. And thank you for your talk as well. And so now we will um, go ahead and open it up for questions for the satsang, both those that are here and those online, if you're online, it's always nice to, um, and, and I don't know, can you, we're going to come off of our Facebook, <laughs> hopefully we were on Facebook, um, we'll come off of our Facebook now, our Facebook friends can join us online, uh, if you go to the, our web page, you can get the Zoom link there and join us, um, so once we're off Facebook, I'd like to invite everybody to open up their cameras. It's always more joyous and maybe you can broaden the camera, Mark, so he can actually see that it's not just a, yeah. So um, it's not just us. You can broaden out of the, the view if you want. I mean, it's not, it's not a, this is a private Zoom now, so it's not on Facebook. Anyway, if you want to put your, um, yeah, it's just nice to see the temple and, you know, all that. Um, you can put your questions in the um, chat or you can open, and, uh, you know, you can just ask them, open up your cameras. We would love to see your face and uh, we'll go with it right now. If anybody has a question, I see Mallory's up there. Do you have a question, Mallory? Just being friendly. <laughs> okay. Anybody here have a question they want to ask uh, Saiganosh? Yeah, well, I'll ask a question. Oh, you got one, Mike. Mike, you go ahead. Hi, Mike. Nice to see you. I was just uh, on Zoom with your sister a few days ago. Oh, that's so wonderful to hear about. I'm so glad. Yes, Saiganosh. I'm so thrilled to see you. And uh, thanks for bringing up my sister. Uh, you know, her husband is not going to help now. Uh, and um, uh, I guess my question was uh, Is it possible that the inner uh, life literally adjusts the outer world? Um, I think it is. Um, I guess that's that's sort of a big question. Let me, while you're thinking about that, um, mention that I believe when I was in Nova Scotia that they had some museums talking about Helen, Helen Keller. So maybe she's from there. I'm going to look that up. But it seems like a lot of the work on helping uh, deaf people happened there in Nova Scotia. It's a very beautiful beautiful place I got to visit on a cruise after we went to Prince Edward Island where uh, Anne of Green Gables, they got the house there and they talk about the wonderful um, author. So just 
just some beauty I wanted to bring up about, about Northeast Canada and what it has to offer us. And then this deep question that as we, you know, the, the, the let's just say the, the burdens of the world or whatever, uh, maybe uh, help us incline us to go inward. And is it not possible that this inward search somehow goes so far inward that the outer becomes inside of it and it actually transforms the outer world for us? You know, I, I think I understood your question. I'm going to share a personal experience, and if I'm not getting it, you can reiterate it to me. It's, it's not, it's perhaps true to many of our personal experiences. I'm just sharing it as my story. You know, when I first read the autobiography of a yogi, I was, it, you know, it was just a gift from Divine Mother. There's no other way to say it. I just had this flash of realization that this is my guru, this is my path, and this is what I needed to do. And um, and I started taking mail order lessons from SRF. Uh, I was back living back in India at that time, so it was called YSS then. And I started meditating. I started doing. I had never met another disciple of Master for the first two and a half years of my spiritual life. I was just, you know, the lessons and the book were all I had, and I used to do that very religiously. And this is the fun part I wanted to share. I used to meditate in the mornings. I used to meditate for twenty five minutes. Uh, after not in the beginning, maybe after six or seven months of practicing what was in the lessons. And, uh, you know, I used to go work out in the mornings and then I had to go to work, I had to make breakfast, everything. Everything was so tightly. It was like a jigsaw puzzle. I'm sure many of you can relate to this. Um, just my commute. I just could carve out 25 minutes, 8 a.m. to 8.25 a.m. every morning when I could meditate. And it went on for a long time, even after I came to the U.S. I was so deeply convinced that I didn't have one minute more. And this was the maximum amount of time that I had in order to meditate. But I was also very sincere. I was trying to grow deeper on the path. And I'd finished all the lessons. I was communicating with the SRF monk in order to get approved for Kriya. And he was telling me that I needed to meditate more. And I was thinking to myself, I'm not against meditating more. I really just don't have time. I just don't have 30 minutes. I have 25 minutes and not a minute more. And, uh, you know, there's no, there's not much to that story, except that I came here to Palo Alto, you know, four or five years later, I had, you know, before I was taking Kriya or I had taken Kriya at that point, you know, somewhere in there, my life was the same, all the pieces were the same, but I just realized, woke up one morning and realized that I actually meditate more than an hour, certainly more than an hour every morning, sometimes even one and a half hours, but it's just like, what happened? Because for so long, that was sort of the biggest obstacle in my spiritual life because I was convinced that I didn't have more than 25 minutes. I never consciously thought about it. I never actually rearranged pieces of my life. I think they just rearranged themselves, <laughs> you know, somewhere in there without even me knowing that made it possible. I don't know if that's what you're asking, but what I wanted to say is, I think the more we grow, we actually realize the inner and the outer life are just reflections of each other. You know, the karma that we are carrying, the lessons that we are working on are constantly reflecting in all the outer circumstances we have. And the, the more we actually go deeper into our inner lives, we realize every single outer situation that we have is nothing but a context. And it's the exact fuel and the fodder that we need in order to go deeper with our inner life, even if that means health crises or an incredibly busy and an overwhelming career or even those type of things that seem on one level like they're taking you away from your inner life when we are able to tune in and feel that connection with god and guru inside we realize that that is actually the exact backdrop i need in order to go deep and make spiritual progress so in a way they're always reflecting each other but when we get restless, we lose that connection. We fail to see that connection between the two. And we are either, you know, we put them in separate boxes, hoping these pieces of my outer life I wish would change so that I could go uh, into my inner life or that I hope my inner life would be deep enough for me to deal with these outside circumstances. Both these questions, I think I'm not 
talking as somebody who's beyond or above any of it. That's just, I think I'm just sharing an experience which is perhaps common to a lot of us. But I think that disconnect itself comes when we are not in that place of deep knowing and attunement, because that wishing for either of those lives to be any different from what they are and thinking God can be found in the future or <laughs> at a different time than exactly in the situation that we are in now. Is that making sense to what you were saying? Is that in line with what you were sharing as well? I, I would say so. That's just uh, what I needed to hear. And also, uh, I think specifically answers the question in terms of the connecting between the two where suddenly it's an observation, gee, I was meditating 25 minutes. Now I'm meditating 65 minutes. Isn't that interesting? What happened there? <laughs> that it, 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 it created a situation, uh, your inner life interconnecting with the outer. So uh, it's, I don't know why I just, you know, sometimes I try to come up with the hardest possible question did very <laughs> well with it. I, you know, I'll also add this because I think it's relevant, which is something I tell myself all the time because it's most it's the most useful thing because even when we ask that question which all of us do it's just until we're self-realized i think it's it's this dichotomy and duality that we're living in i think the important thing for us to rem remind ourselves as the answer is it's not fixing anything it's lifting my vibration you know I went from 25 minutes to an hour, not by working any piece out, going back to the topic for today, just by associating with Ananda, coming here, meeting Swami, going to the village, coming here every Sunday, serving here, somewhere in there, my vibration had shifted. That now was reflecting a different outer life. So I think the, the real practical point to keep reminding ourselves off is just, let's all this keep lifting our vibration up you know, satsang, seva, chanting, meditation, uh, you know, all of those things that we all have the wonderful opportunity of as those living in communities, um, I mean, associated with spiritual communities. I think that's really what helps because before you realize it's no longer a question because your vibration is now taken you outside of that. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. You have a question there, um, Eric? Uh, yeah, actually, and by the way, thank you, Saiganesh. Your, your talk was so wonderful. Um, your poise and your articulation, and obviously the way you organize your life is so apparent in the way you speak, and praise to you for that. Um, I just kind of launched off a little bit from what you were saying about um, the way emails, we, we structure emails, and I, I'm a writer and an artist, so I think a lot about how culture operates and how it moves towards informing us and your your comments around the rational mind are true but it seems like so much of what we do in the rational world especially if we're spiritual people is we're trying to create we're trying to organize and this is just an observation not a question um, we're trying to organize songs and emails and talks and altars and structures that are in the rational world to point beyond the rational world that we're, we're trying to make all of our objects within the empirical world, you know, the, um, the world of the five senses, to indicate something else so that that higher path can be present to us, so that, high, that higher path can, can inspire us and always be present to us. But we do it with these rational maps in a way, the rational, we don't get there through the rational, but we can create rational objects which point beyond their own structure. They're paradoxical in their very nature. And so that was just an observation. I thought about that with an email. An email is like a hologram of us. It's like it gives some indication of who we are just in the structure of the language, whatever it is that we create. Yeah, that's a, well, that's a precisely accurate observation. You know, I think of it as, you know, we, fun, we, we are made and it's the rational mind is a God-given gift for us to function and progress and work in this world. It's not an obstacle. <laughs> you know, it is something that uh, we have to use constantly. The last week's topic, which is not what we're talking about now, is dogmatism versus common sense. It sounds like unrelated, but it's actually related because there we were talking about the need for common sense, just being in this world, just being grounded, being able to work through objective understanding of what 
the world around us is what am i dealing with what's the world like do i have to get a job do i have to not be in this relationship do i have to move to a different city all of this is just the thinking process that's essential in order to integrate whatever spiritual knowing we have whatever intuitive realization we have because that integration has to happen on this material plane on that plane of duality on that plane of emails and communication and uh, organization management planning money bank accounts all those things you know we cannot we, we have been placed in this context our outer life is exactly what it looks like because all of this is part of our growth and for us to use our rational mind to work through that is exactly um, what we need to do in order to spiritually progress also you know just just adding in a, a firm attesting whatever your observations were exactly any that's part of who we are and as important while also realizing that realizations and actual truth is going to be revealed differently and then our mind will have to wait through work through integrate process and then bring it all together in our lives thank you i i think i i'm my prayer as a devotee is that my intuitive mind my intuitive knowing informs my rational mind that's that's where i'm you know praying for um but i do want to I, I i have a question if 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 this is uh something that is uh no he, he can hear me through this yeah um uh, you'd be willing to answer i i i've been pondering this i uh would like to know if you could share with us uh, a story uh, of your own life about some of the challenges that you've had on the spiritual path. Um, you know, one story or, or something that, you know, you, it would just be, uh, it's always helpful and uh, <laughs> to hear that if, if you're willing. <laughs> There's probably many, not just one, but uh, <laughs> let me think. Yeah, there, you know, all of us, let me just say, the details are the details, but all of us also just have challenging faces that we go through in our lives, just karmic bombs that uh, sort of blow up sometimes. And um, suddenly, I, you know, because this is a private Zoom, I'm just going to share more honestly, and because I, it's not something that's, that has any life beyond this conversation that we're all having, which is just heart to heart. You know, I... Um, just when I decided to move out of my corporate career. And um, it was a decision that was uh, well pondered upon and I was, um, I really wanted it for sure. There was no doubt about that. There was just um, no looking back. But then, and I had to work through it in for many months, just like, how am I going to make it work in terms of income? What is my life gonna look like? You know, just all those different pieces that you can just imagine. But then when I was actually there, when I was trying to make things work, I just realized that a lot of my own, um, I, I had not integrated my aspirations fully into my inner reality. That's the perhaps the, uh, the right way to say it, because I just started feeling like, am I really sure? Am I really sure? I just, I feel like I'm missing that. I'm missing this, I'm missing that. And, uh, maybe I, I'm missing this bit of financial freedom. I'm missing this field of just not feeling like I have a real place in the world, you know, whatever that is. Uh, there's so many of those emotions. We're really becoming very strong in me for some time, for I would say for at least a period of six to eight months. And um, I would say it was, it was somewhat of a challenging time. I would say it was certainly, when you said challenging, I instead of thinking of something small, I was thinking of things that I've found in the last few years that really rattled me more than I would wish to admit. And uh, it was a very interesting journey for me to go through that. Now I look back at it, somewhere in there, just like going from 25 minutes to an hour of meditation, I just kept putting one foot in front of the other. And I think uh, Master just helped me through a lot of it. He just held my hands and helped me walk through some of those challenges. Um, in order to just answer your question, it, to share what I really learned or what how it all worked for me, I think um, the one thing certainly is it, it's such an odd thing to say, but you know, as it's not like I have decades of experience, I still consider myself very young and still growing. 
um you know the the words that we that Naisomi Maria shared during the last few days of her life um, that has been a guiding post for my life through a lot of the tumult or challenges that I have faced. I'll share it with all of you in case you've not heard it. When uh, she was diagnosed, uh, when her cancer record and Devashi, who was her husband at that time, was carrying her into the last surgery and she knew that she was not going to live very long. This was going to be the end or very close to the end. And Devashi was very, very, very overwhelmed and upset with what was happening. And she looked at him and said, said these, offered these three pity one-liners that a lot of us in Ananda have used as our guide since then. Detach yourself, control the reactive process, live the teachings. Um, and I'll repeat it for myself and for all of us. Detach yourself, control the reactive process, live the teachings. You know, what I've noticed is when I'm going through challenging phases, and I think this is probably what's universally applicable, even quite apart from my circumstance or situation, I think there's a lot of ways in which Satan enters each one of us. There's certainly a strong way of negativity. In some, in some people, it is self-criticism. In some people, it's negativity towards others. In some people, it's just a tendency for depression and sadness. You know, each one of us takes on our own individual color of what that negative vibration is. Um, I think as we are going through and we are holding tight to master, that's the first thing, hold on to that thread of intuitive understanding that we have had. Go back to the time when you first read the AY, when you, when you first uh, had a spiritual experience on this path that is still, uh, that convinced you, that gave you faith. Stand on that bedrock of faith and hold to that thread. And also on a day-to-day basis as we go through as we communicate with others as we in our own self-talk you know just use these three uh statements as a guidance you know i wish you know they always say what would you tell your 10 year old self or <laughs> you know those kind of uh hypothetical ex exercises i think as i grow and mature more i think i try to practice that not that i have I'm done with challenges or I'm completely in a place of perfect self-transcendence. But, you know, even when you're going through a tumultuous inner reality, I think I'd like to remind myself so that, you know, I'm not creating more karma. That's that's the only way to put it. As I'm going through this challenging spin, just because I am upset today, I'm not just saying something mean to my spouse or to my coworker that has created another ripple of karma that I need to come back and resolve later. So yes, look at this as something you're going through. And I'll just share one more line because I'm just very fond of this one too. When the great teacher Amrit Desai, um, you know, he had a lot of, he was a big yoga figure in the US before my times, maybe in the 70s or 80s or something. And he had a great work and there were a lot of allegations and uh, he had slipped and there were some things that he did that he was not proud of. And interestingly, all of this transpired into him being kicked out of his own organization. So the disciples had to take over the organization in order to not tarnish its name and he had to be kicked out. And then he was spending time with Michael Singer, who was a very famous author, who also many of you may know. And when, uh, Michael recollects what how Amrit described what he was going through. He never said, I was going through a difficult uh, time. He always said, a difficult time was going through me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that is a very helpful and important way for us to think through that. That helps us. That is part of teaching yourself, controlling the reactive process and living the teachings is to understand, you know, I'm very this is not how I would have wanted things to go. This is not a health condition that I invited to myself. This is not what I wanted to happen to this friend or to this dear one. And it is a difficult time, but I'm not going through a difficult time. A difficult time is going through me. I don't change. I am the same before and after. And even now my responses can come from uh, a higher place than being caught in that way of negativity of that down, downward energy. Oh, such heartfelt wisdom intuitively flowing through you. Thank you so much. We, we learn so much from each other in these thought songs and, and that was very uh, 
that, that touched me deeply. And I think it touched a few other people deeply as well. That's, that's just beautiful. Thank you for, for sharing with us. Um, do you have a question? So I see your hand. Can raised. I just um, go from all of this wonderful information, these words, these, I feel it's all really inspired by master um, God and gurus and just sort of continuing saying and seeing even these difficult times that zing us or try to zing us, <clears throat> right? We try to respond rather than react seeing even those as our, as our opportunities for growth, rather than going, oh, what's going on here? And I'm just saying for my own self, you know, sometimes I feel like, yeah. whoa, I've just been zinged. And then I realize, well, I can choose to feel the zing, or I can say, aha, here you are again, divine mother, or master, um, giving me another opportunity. So I'm just trying to train my mind and my any reaction to the response of even seeing those times as opportunities for growth, because I truly believe they are in my rational mind. And now it's just uh, the response being trained to be a little different and more highly uh, guided. And yeah. I'm so glad you shared that. Yeah, that is so, so important. I, I want to share one brief image because I think I, that's so, I'm so glad you sp spoke and Master wanted to share that through you. You know, when the great speaker Ramdas was no longer living, Richard Alpert, uh, and there's this documentary called Fierce Grace. It's a very famous documentary. It was done during the first few years when he had had a stroke. And, you know, he was lying on his bed and he fell down and had a complete stroke. This was during the time he had, was the busiest public speaker. He was serving, helping, guiding so many people, hundreds across the country. And one fine night, he just gets knocked off from his bed and he has a stroke and he loses pretty much 80, 90% of his mobility. And then in this documentary, he even loses words. Even his brain functioning to communicate is lost in that stroke. And then he says, when he has regained, in this, doc, in this interview, he's not speaking coherently as much. But then he says, talks of his guru, you know, guru's hand came, hit me, pushed me. And it was an act of grace. That's what he tries to say, that the stroke that completely incapacitated him was nothing but an act of grace from his guru, that it actually pushed him off of the bed and completely made him disabled. Yeah, so thank you for sharing, Supriya. Just to even, that's the highest way to look at it. And whether you know constantly reminding ourselves because that is the only truth you know if we if we are all disciples then everything that comes the any challenge or any difficult situation is always a gift for coming from master so is there anybody uh, online that has a question we've taken a few here in person but i don't know if anybody online would like to ask a question we'll pause here for a moment you can Open your camera or your Hi, mic. Hi, I'm Mal I do. Okay. I'm Mallory. Thank you, Saganesh, for your music and your stories and your presence. Um, I wondered if you could say a couple minutes about the trip to India and where you're planning to go. Uh, yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, our dear friend Colin is not with us today. He is going to be joining me as well. Uh, so Jitendra and I are, um, so last year, um, a few of us from Palo Alto went, went on the same trip. And this year I decided we'll go as a bigger group, slightly bigger group of Kriyabans, uh, traveling together. We are going to go to three main places, uh, Babaji's cave, which is in the foothill of the Himalayas, which is high up in the mountains. And then from there, we cross over through the Himalayas to Badrinath which is a very sacred high Himalayan shrine. In the autobiography, Master says, Babaji today lives in the hills above Badrinath. It's considered a temple for Babaji. So Babaji's cave and then Badrinath, which is also said to be the place where Babaji lives today. And from there we come down, we have a couple of days of retreat outside Rishikesh by Ganges in a beautiful um, wellness retreat place. And then uh, we go to Vrindavan, 
I'm sure you've heard Devi, Diana, Jyotish, and others share a lot of stories about Ananda's work with the widows there. And so we take all of this attunement and inner communion and the energy that we have gathered and we share it in service to the widows for the last three days of the trip. We'll be serving with the widows, helping them in the care homes and the hospitals, just trying to get a feel for the work there and also um, give them our energy. So that's uh, the trip. It's a little less than three weeks. And it's uh, towards the end of October, like 21st or something like that. Thank you. I hope that's the, you'll offer that trip again. Sounds really wonderful. <laughs> Absolutely, we have to take you. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I would love, I'd love to do that. I definitely would love to visit Babaji's cave and, and those places. I have not been to India, so that's a, a trip. I, I don't know, it's on the bucket list. <laughs> So anybody else here or online? This is pretty much we're getting close to our time here. If anybody else has something they would like to say, or at least open your cameras and wave, and we'll give that opportunity. It's also it's always nice to see folks. Um, but it's been really wonderful to have you, and we're 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 gonna have you in person someday. We definitely would love to have you in person. You we know. Can, I have, I have to say, I have traveled to Dallas a few times for work. So I, Dallas has to, <laughs> it sounds funny to say it. I was going to say, we'll have to redeem its image. I'm sure I'm going to have oh. such a <laughs> wonderful time with all of you because uh, <laughs> it's not like, I mean, I had a perfectly fine time, but I was driving around Dallas a few times. It was like eight, nine years ago. I used to travel a lot for work. And uh, you know, I used to drive around and thinking, wow, this place is so large and so barren and it's boring. <laughs> but now, now. <laughs> it's going to be so much but, fun when I come see all of you because it won't be boring at all. It's no. going to be full of light and joy. You're definitely going to have to come now after those remarks. <laughs> I look forward to that. Mark, did you have something you wanted to say? No, I just wanted to show my face mostly. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, I did. But I, I will say that I thank you very much for your what you said about transitioning out of the corporate world and mm -hmm. and the difficulty and and how it you know took some time and you know you had to be really clear on what it was you really wanted and I th and this, that's what I took from it and. Um, um, you know, I mean, because that, that's something I'm going through myself. My my separation from the corporate world was not voluntary, but it was time. It was definitely time. So, <laughs> I'm so glad you shared that. Yeah, I, you know, it's it's a, a lot of people are going through that right now, and um, you know, there's always a growth process in that. And I'm so glad, you know, just uh, you know, it was a joy to see you initiated as a minister, and just to see all the ways in which all of you were serving and. That in itself is such a gift during any challenging time that we have a community where we can serve and an opportunity where we can connect with Master and give and share. So, Om Om. Om Om. Thank you so much. Jai Guru. Jai Guru. I'm going to write the uh, quote I shared in chat. So, is my mic still on? Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Everybody needs to hear this. <laughs> Not because it's coming from me. <laughs> I heard Saganesh say he's been to Dallas. I heard him say something about boring. And then he said, we know it, it won't be boring. It won't be boring now because this Ananda Sangha has been going for 30 years. We have our beautiful new space. And this is an official invitation. I just cleared it with my attorney. <laughs> and we, have, we have the power, if you will, from God Absolutely. to say, if to you would like that. to come toward the middle or end of this summer, it's officially extended and we're going to follow up and see if that's possible. So yeah, absolutely. I, I if you can let, if you can talk Palo Alto into letting you break away for a weekend or so. Uh, yeah, just so that five work. days. We just need four or five days. In, in the heat of the summer, because that is your karma. You'll love it. Yeah, that won't be boring. <laughs> I am from the southern part of India, believe me. <laughs> okay. Well, it, it's like Palo Alto has 
an amazing uh, hive of honey there, you know, <laughs> with all of you guys. And we, we have just enjoyed, uh, you know, bringing folks out from Palo Alto. It's, you know, when Asha was here, it was such a blessing yeah. and Keshava and, you know, it's, it's so we definitely, we would love to have you come. And I know you've got a lot going on there, but think about it. And uh, my pleasure. summer is a good time. I know, oh, it's nervous, okay. but, uh, you know, because everywhere, the classes and all of that, we have a lot of teachers and a lot of things related to our school here. All of it sort of mellow down for us <laughs> during that time. So, okay. Yeah. So those lovely. emails, those emails <laughs> that you talked about before, be watching for one <laughs> <laughs> with much love. My pleasure. It's just so such a joy, and I was so happy to see all of you together in another renewal week. You know, you had a bigger crowd than most other large and on the communities. So it was it's so nice to see Masters' work thriving and all of you just sharing and serving in His name. Just a real joy. Would come love to come see all of you. Well, thank you, and we're going to officially end here by doing our. Um, Texas uh, form of goodbye, <laughs> which is we all just bring our hands together at the heart and we say namaste, namaste y'all. <laughs> namaste y'all. <laughs>